whenever you're walking in God's call in your life, I believe you have his favor. Mm-hmm. And whatever it is, again, if, if you're called to be an attorney, if you're called to do construction, whatever it is, and sometimes, you know, Darren, sometimes people think, well, I can't be called to be in construction. I don't believe that. Right. I, I honestly believe that God has you where you are. Maybe it's just for a time being, but he has you where you are with a purpose. Mm-hmm. Welcome to the Darren Early Wine Podcast, where we awaken you to become who you were born to be. Here's your host, Darren Early Wine. Welcome back to the Darren Early Wine Podcast, and the crowd goes wild. Oh my gosh, the studio audience today, it's, they're packed, it's full, social distance, masks, of course. Welcome back to the Darren Early Wine Podcast. It's episode 18. Today we sit down with the senior pastor of Northview Church, Steve Poe. P-O-E, that's how you spell the name, in case you're wanting for a uh, crossword puzzle. Uh, not that funny, but I'm going to give myself a laugh track just because I want to push buttons today. Hey, high energy, feeling good. The sun is out, and uh, I'm feeling a lot of energy right now because we just got through Giving Tuesday when we're recording this uh, podcast. is going to come out later, but I want to give a huge thank you to all of you that gave uh, and partner with us on Giving Tuesday. We were able to match the $20,000 uh, grant that was given to us, which is amazing. Uh, we've actually exceeded. We were able to raise just over uh, twenty-five thousand, and then they had the twenty match came in, and uh, to raise forty-five thousand uh, dollars in a day for our mission for for Blackbird Mission, our nonprofit, uh, allows us to continue to do this podcast, a spiritual DNA online course, live workshops, and pub theology uh, for another year which is a game changer for us. So thank you so much for those that partnered with us. Uh, It means the world uh, to us. And for me, you know, uh, this podcast is about us awakening you to become who you were born to be. Every week we want to tell you that God has created you on purpose and for a purpose, that God is near you, not far away from you, that God is for you, not against you. And the reason we, we interview the people we do is because they have made strides in this pursuit and we want it to be something that inspires you. Maybe you've taken the Spiritual DNA online course and you need some inspiration, you need some stories that you can walk beside to give you the energy, uh, to give you the, the the perseverance that you need to become who God's created you to be. And that's where these stories and where this podcast comes in. And and part of it for me is stepping into that moment myself and um, and to see folks come along and, and God provide the finances for us to continue to do this mission. Uh, so inspirational and it warms my heart. And today's uh, episode we talked to Steve Poe. Uh, if, it, if it needed a name, it would be called Two Washed Up Rock and Roll Drummers Walk Into a Bar. Uh, that's not what it would be called, but it would be called maybe Two Rock and Roll Drummers Sit Down to Discuss Calling because uh, we started the interview with Steve Poe. I've known Steve Poe. He's an amazing pastor. He's been doing, uh, he's been leading Northview Church here in Indy for, um, I think, about 21 years. He'll say it in the, he'll say it in the, in the interview here. Um, when he took over the church, 500 people. Now they have nearly 20,000 people in like 11 different campuses all over town. He's, he's done some amazing, amazing work. But the cool part, we sit down and talk about his journey, and he says, hey, here's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a, a drummer in a rock and roll band. He was touring around the Midwest in a van playing drums, and I was like, Steve, I think you and me just became best friends, buddy. I mean, look at this. We could bunk our beads up so much for more room for activities. Uh, it was, yeah, sorry, laugh track there. It was, it was a good one. Anyway, and uh, what I loved about Steve is he walked um, me through this journey of walking into calling. And as I was reviewing the podcast uh, interview today, I realized that I think within Steve's story, not only did I find my story, but I found connection to so many biblical stories of people walking into calling. And I think you're going to find yourself in the story as well. And it's important for us to connect there because here's the deal. You may be somewhere in this kind of what we'll, maybe we'll call like a story arc of calling, and you may think that uh, that this is unique to you. So the first step in it is is resist. We're going to unpack this when we come back from the interview. I want to take you through this journey. But you may be in a place right now where you're resisting what God you, is calling you into. You may think that's unique to you. Like, I, you know, I just, God can't work in my life because I'm, I'm battling. I'm just resisting what he wants and no one else does this. Now, here's the deal. It seems to me from the Bible stories, my life, Steve's life, and probably your life, I think we all do that. I think that's step one is that God begins to work in our life. We begin to see a place of calling and the, the, the seeds of it. And I think as a human being, we resist it. Uh, for you, you may be at a place where you're like, I don't know, I've just, I, I, I've got past resistance, but I'm just wrestling with God right now. I just, I'm, I'm fighting, I'm wrestling, and I, that's just me. I just must be a rebellious person. No, that's actually step three in the process that we're going to unpack uh, through Steve's story, through a couple of biblical stories. When we come back from this interview, I think uh, you're going to enjoy it. And so let's jump into it. Thanks so much for downloading this episode. 
Thanks for subscribing to the podcast, uh, leaving us a review. Um, we love walking this journey with you. And here's our interview with Steve Post, senior pastor of Northview Church here in Indianapolis on the Darren Early Wine podcast. Hey, I'm excited to sit down today with the uh, lead pastor of Northview Church here in Carmel, Indiana, Steve Poe. Steve, you've been the pastor there uh, for 21 years. Yeah. I've seen a lot of amazing stuff happen. I'm excited to, to have you on the podcast today, hear a little more about your story, and uh, see where the conversation takes us. Great. I'm really excited to be here, Darren. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, awesome. See, one thing that it jumped out to me about you uh, right off the bat when we first got connected, and I can't, I can't remember how we first... Uh, you know, cross paths. But I remember talking about at that point, uh, we were still leading pub theology, the ministry we have here in town, where we go out to local bars and, and spread a little faith, hope, and love for the sure. kingdom. And, and I remember you said, Hey, I, I, I'm interested in your event and I'd, I'd love to come and bring my wife and we'd like to come see it. And I'll be honest at that point, I thought, well, that that's nice that Steve was nice enough to say that he was, you know, I mean, not, not that I'm saying you were lying. I've just had people say like, I'd like yeah. to come. And I'm like, I'm sure you'd like to come, but you're not going to show up. Right. <laughs> and literally it was probably, you know, 48 hours. I think that we were having an event that week and we got done setting up and we were getting ready to start the event. And, and you and your wife walked in and you were there that night and, uh, and, and stayed the whole night. We talked a little bit after that. And, uh, and that meant the world to me, uh, that, that, you know, leading a church of thousands of people that you'd give up a night that you'd come to see what we were doing. And what it showed to me that night is that, that you had a heart to see people that were far from God reached and were open to new innovative ways to, to do that. And, uh, it just meant the world to me. So I appreciate it. Oh, wow. I was blown away by your ministry. Still am Darren. And just, uh, being there that night, it was beyond what we anticipated even being. Cause to be honest, when you first explained it to me, I, I wasn't sure I fully grasped it or understood it. <laughs> yeah. But then uh, to go and watch you work and watch you minister in that setting, uh, it was just very, very cool. Well, thank you very much, Steve. I want to jump into your story a little bit because you, one thing I love about, uh, we talked a little bit before we jumped on air here is you had a, a sense of calling in your life, but there was a part where you really kind of resisted that because you had some ambitions, some dreams, some thoughts of what you wanted to be a part of. And I want to talk about that because um, I think a lot of people, um, if they're followers of Jesus, a lot of our audience are, is they they want to, to do they want to do God's will. Sure. But I think there's a part where some people lack an imagination for what God could actually like they they think there's no way I could do something that big or they they lack that imagination for themselves. But then I think another part of it is they they really struggle to trust God's heart that he that he would take care of them in life or that they could trust God with their dreams. So take us back to that tension for you of of feeling like maybe God was calling you into ministry but trying to to balance that tension of of your own dreams and ambitions. Well, actually, Darren, I I was in a uh, through high school, I was in a Christian rock group and we uh, traveled around and really? that was my uh, I was a drummer. Were you really? Yeah. I didn't know we, I didn't know we had this connection. <laughs> You're looking at two rock and roll drummers here. You're welcome, yeah. all right? That's awesome. I didn't know that. You guys yeah. traveled around everything and played? We did, through the Midwest, through a four state area. You still have a drum kit right now? I don't. I don't. I sold my drum set. The the uh, the guys in our worship team keep trying to get me to join in with them, but uh, <laughs> Those days are gone. Hey, I would love it. That would be a great. I actually got to play. I told where I'm helping uh, Mercy Roads, the church in town. I'm helping them launch a new campus. And I said, hey, I'll, I'll speak twice a month and, and help, you know, the, the get the, the, the community launched. I said, but here's the deal. I said, this is totally selfish. But I was like, for the first couple of months, if we, if, you're, if we don't have enough drummers, I'm like, I'll play, I'll play drums when I preach. So, cause I just wanted to play again. I haven't played in so long. Yeah. So I played this past, this past week and it went okay, but I was more terrified playing than I've ever been preaching. Speaking. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I didn't know we had yeah. the connection in drumming. Okay. Yeah, well, the first church I pastored in Missouri, um, we were short a drummer. And so I would play the drums uh, every other weekend yeah. and then step away and get up and preach. Yeah. And uh, it felt pretty small church doing it like that. <laughs> Was it energizing though? Did you enjoy being able to do both? I yeah, I did, I did. But when I came to Northview, I thought, okay, it's time to stop that and focus on 
<laughs> God's called me yeah. to do. Yeah, I find that I, I feel like I almost worship better in those mornings because like I don't sing very well, right? But I, it's, you know, playing for me is an you know, expression. I, I feel more worshipful, except when I screw up and don't play to the click like I did this week. And then I'm <laughs> terrified of what's going on. But anyway, yeah. enough about drumming. So you, right. you're a drummer, you're in a rock band. So take us, continue. Okay. So I was, I was in a rock band. We were traveling four state area. And during that time, I felt God's call in my life to ministry. But I'll be honest with you, I didn't want to go into ministry because I had this entrepreneurial thing going on in my life. And I wanted to be in business. I had since I was a young kid and I just wanted to be in business. Mm. And so um, as I graduated, then I started negotiating with God and saying, well, you know, like, let me just go into business. And after I'm successful, then later in life, I'll switch over to ministry. And so that's what I did, actually. Um, I went into business and started opening up businesses and uh, had a couple restaurants that I owned and a financial planning firm and a radio station. And I just kept adding. But the whole there's a story behind the story that people say, man, you were really diversified. But the truth of the matter was I wasn't finding satisfaction Mm -hmm. because I wasn't doing what God called me to do. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, it's just, I need, so I'd get somebody to manage that business and then I'd go start another one. And that would be exciting for six months to a year. And then I'd get bored with it. Mm -hmm. And so I'd get somebody to manage that business and I'd go start another one, but I couldn't find satisfaction. And so through a series of events, it's a long story, actually, Darren, but God got my attention and uh, brought me to my knees. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, I agreed to stop running and to go into ministry. And so I talked to my pastor, who was a good friend, and he said, you just need to be found faithful in whatever I'm asking you to do, and God will raise you up. And so he he had me teaching classes of six people or ten people, and and, uh, but it was through that that... um, um, when he left the church under some difficult circumstances for himself, uh, they asked me if I would consider at least filling in. Mm. And uh, so I said yes, and I started filling in for him. And, and uh, then they came back around and said, would I consider it? And it was just a small church. of, At that time, it was like 250 people. Mm. And, um, and I had already felt like God had called me to pastor this church, but I didn't want to tell him. I wanted them to um, figure that out. Yeah. So anyway, uh, that was uh, in St. Joseph, Missouri. I became the pastor of that church. Uh, they voted me in by one vote. <laughs> <laughs> one vote. It's, it's overwhelming. Oh, you know? my gosh. <laughs> killed my ego. <laughs> but I got elected by one vote. And yeah. so I, I said to the people, I said, okay, uh, give me one year, and then I'm going to have you vote again. Mm. And if you don't feel it's a God thing, I'm going to step out of the way. Mm. If I feel like it's a God thing, I want you to vote. So a year, a year later, I did that, and they unanimously voted me in. Mm. And so I was pastor there for 13 years. But the thing I want to bring you back to is that for the first time in my life, I was satisfied mm. because I was finally in what God made me to be, doing what God called me to do. I was in my sweet spot and um, so there wasn't anything wrong with being in business at all. Yeah. It's just not what God called me to do. Mm. And I think that's, that's really important for uh, people that are they're trying to decide, well, maybe God wants to call me into full-time ministry. Well, maybe he does, and maybe he's got you right where he wants you because you'll have more impact on people in the secular world than you will in ministry. Mm. One of our worship leaders um, came to me one time, and he's like, I just, I'm not happy. I'm not satisfied at this. And I said, well, maybe God's not really called you into ministry. Mm. But his deal was he he felt guilty not serving God. Mm. And so I said, God's not going to be mad at you, and you're going to find more satisfaction doing what God's called you to do. Mm -hmm. Well, he came back and resigned the next day, and um, I've heard from him, and he's just doing great. He's in the secular world, still serving God. But anyway, that's a long way around, Darren, to just say um, ministry is not, uh, God's ultimate calling. Yeah, it's being where God's called you to be is so the good. ultimate thing. So, so good, Steve. I want to go back, like when you were younger and and you had that that you know kind of like I don't want to do ministry. Were there people? Um, were the people that you would that you had looked up to or kind of like idols or examples of like man I want to be like that guy or or what was it that drew you? Because I can think about when I was fighting calling is I, you know I was a drum and rock band like and you know I had some like Christian you know bands I listened to but it's like you know as a 
18 year old kid. Like I kind of wanted to be Tommy Lee and Motley Crue. I'm like, you know, that guy's got cars and girls and money. And you know, my dad was a pastor and I'm like, our cars are old and beat up and you know, we don't have any money. And, but I, I had all these thoughts and what I didn't know in my immaturity that like, that I think God had placed into me in, and it, it sounds similar to you. Like I, I, you know, from Ephesians chapter four it talks about, you know, apostles and prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. I know that I have an apostolic or an entrepreneur pioneering calling. And I was drawn to that kind of thing. And I think in my brain, the examples I'd seen of, of church or of ministry were, were not pioneering. We're not, you know, uh, an apostolic kind of, you know, visionary driving things forward. It was more of a, a, you know, a protective kind of defensive stance. And I think I, 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 I had a vision for the kind of life that I think was what God placed in me. But I just didn't have the examples to say it could look like that. Did you, were you limited, you feel like, in some of your imagination of the people that are around you or what or how you saw what you thought ministry had to be? Well, yeah, what really, what really um, was driving me towards ministry, other than feeling like God had a call in my life, was... Um, uh, Clear back, it'll date me, but back in 1972 was what, Explo uh, 72, which is the first Jesus rally in the United States in Dallas, Texas. And the whole point of that, it was Campus Crusade for Christ, and they were teaching you to share your faith. And basically what they did, 80,000 people converged on Dallas, and they trained us during the day to share our faith. Then they gave us all addresses and dropped us off in, in neighborhoods all over Dallas, 80,000 wow. people. And we were to go door to door and and share the four spiritual laws. Well, the first I was with a with a girl friend, and we went to about three doors. The third door, I'm going through this spiel. The lady invites us in. I go through the four spiritual laws and say, "Would you like to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior?" And she said, "Yes, I would." And so, you know, I, we turn her TV off, and I said, "Would you kneel here with me on the uh, at the dining room table here at the." Uh, table there in front of her couch. Mm -hmm. And so we all knelt. She prayed with me to receive Christ. It changed her life, but it probably changed my life more. Mm -hmm. I went out of there and it's like, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. I just impacted someone for eternity. I yeah. played a part in that. And from then on, I was sharing my faith all the time. Mm -hmm. And that was what was really driving me. So even though my dream was in the business world, I still was very involved with church. I was still very involved with evangelism in our church. And, and then I had, because I had that driving thing going on in me, that entrepreneurial thing going on, um, today I call it the it factor. You know, you just, there's just something, you just, I knew that I knew that I knew I could run that church better <laughs> than they were running it. Yeah. And so there was this thing that, you know, like if I could just pastor, I know we could reach hundreds, if not thousands of people. And so that's what drove me towards pastoral ministry was, um, you know, the heart of an evangelist. Mm. Um, you know, later I, be, I, I became more aware of the importance of discipleship, that if you don't grow these people up, they're not going to stick with it. But right. in the early days, it was strictly, I just wanted people to find Christ. Mm you know, as their Savior and Lord. So um, I maybe didn't answer your question. I don't know, Darren, but No, that's... it did. One thing I love about it, Steve, is to see like when you, you know, one thing we teach people in our spiritual DNA course is like to understand, you got to understand who God's created you to be. Exactly. Because it's it, it it's going to inform and transform everything you do. And and when you know that and you lean into that, it, it's it's going to come out in every arena, whether it's it, it's business, whether it's ministry, whatever. And, and for you, being more, you know, pioneering entrepreneur, being apostolic, like you, you could strategically, and that's a key thing that, that apostles can do is that you could see the systems and the structures and be you know, saying, I know I could run that better, but it was informed by that, by a missional heart. Like, man, I want to see us change every, you know, people's life. Yeah. And I think I could actually go in there and see eternal impact. And I guess, you know, if you're listening, what I want to encourage you is, is discover that. And then, and this may sound weird, but but trust yourself. Mm. If you're learning more about who God's created you to be and you're learning to trust God, is trust where that, you know, I remember Erwin McManus talking about once you're, you, you've you given your heart to the, to the Lord, the things that you're still drawn to and most passionate about, they they are the great compass of your soul to say, man, that's what I'm, I want to be a part of. And you, yes. you were drawn to that. I, I'm guessing you were in for, how long were you at the church in St. Louis? St. Joseph, St. Joseph, 13 years, 13 years. Mm -hmm. And then you came here to, here to North town to Northview. Mm -hmm. 
church of 500 when you came. Right. Now, pre-COVID, when we could actually go to church, right? You guys, uh, it 13 campuses, is that right? Yeah. Four of them in jails, right. which I... That's one of the, my favorite things that churches are doing right now. I think it's yeah. absolutely phenomenal. But you guys have thousands and thousands and thousands of people that are part of Northview right now. When I see Northview's church, when I see the, the, the people of Northview, when I see the culture you've created, and I've always thought this, and is, and, and I could be wrong, but I feel like you have sown a very pioneering entrepreneurial heart, you know, fueled by a heart for evangelism into that community. Um, you guys, you reach business leaders, you reach entrepreneurs, you guys. And so do you feel like as you look back at the 21 years of developing that culture, you came with, you know, a nice group of 500, but to see what it's become, um, do you, do you feel like, have you guys been purposeful in building that kind of heart into the culture? You know, I don't know that I can say we've been purposeful in doing that, but at the same time, um, I think I've been able to, most of the people at our church have heard my story and yeah. know my story. And I, and I was in the business world as an entrepreneur for about 12 years. Yeah. And so I think that gives me uh, something to relate with business guys. Yep. You know, it's like they feel a little bit safer talking to me than, than say, a pastor that's never even done a secular job. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so they go to him and they're thinking, this guy can't relate to my struggles. He cannot understand what I'm going through, but they know at least I've been there. Yeah. So I don't know that we've been purposeful in it, but it certainly has played a part. Yeah. And, uh, and because I, I have a passion to reach men. And so for, you know, 21 years, I've uh, consistently taken guys to lunch all the time, just getting to know them, just getting them to open up and, um, I'm never shy about getting in their face a little bit. Mm -hmm. And most businessmen aren't, aren't offended by that. Yeah. You know, they, they really want somebody to be honest with them and to speak to them straight. And so it's helped a lot. Yeah. Well, I think that that principle is that you, you reproduce, you know, what you are. I think that's true. You know, and so it's just like you being who you are and who God's created you to be, you, you've, you've raised up and seen those type of leaders and it's created the culture uh, of Northview, which is, which is a, a, a great church. Talk a little bit about, has it been, that I love the part you, that we're talking about, the, just the fulfillment of it. I've been a pastor now for a lot of years, not as many as you, but I've watched my dad go through it. Sure. It can be tough work. Yeah. Um, but talk about that, that the, the fulfillment of stepping in and staying in that place of calling. I, I guess... Um, so many people, I think, are, are seeking that. Like you, you even said that they they may have all the trappings of even success, but something feels empty. Um, has uh, talk about that sense of fulfillment that you've experienced as you continue to walk in and and knowing that you're you're where God's called you to be. Well, again, it's just you know I look forward to getting out of bed every morning, and I still do. And I I've, I've told my wife when it ever changes, when I don't look forward to getting up in the morning and going mm -hmm. to work, that's the time for me to step aside. But right now I'm still passionate about it. I love it. I believe it's God, God's call in my life. And uh, whenever you're walking in God's call in your life, I believe you have his favor. Mm -hmm. And whatever it is, again, if, if you're called to be an attorney, if you're called to do construction, whatever it is. And sometimes, you know, Darren, sometimes people think, well, I can't be called to be in construction. I don't believe that. Right. I, I honestly believe that God has you where you are. Maybe it's just for a time being, but he has you where you are with a purpose. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe because there's a handful of people he wants you to influence, but you're there. A lot of times people get discouraged. They'll say, well, Steve, I'm trying to find another job, but I, I, you know, I've been praying about it and I just can't seem to, God's not opening any doors. And I said, well, then maybe he's not done with you right where you're at. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the point, and I'm getting off target here, is that whenever you're in that sweet spot, um, there is a joy that I think you feel um, when you're there. Yeah. And it's not about the money. Um, you know, I could make more money in the secular world than certainly I can in ministry, but yeah. I would never go back mm. because I'm where God wants me to be. Yeah. And I don't know. Steve, I know you're passionate about, about getting people to dream big. Yeah. And, and, and you guys have it at, at Northview. Why do you think... Um, I guess maybe just through your personal vision, if you go back 21 years ago to, to, to Steve Poe, he, he comes to town, he gets a church of 5, 500 people. Did you have a dream 
could, could you even imagine what the impact that Northview's had in the church that has become? Were, were your dreams that big at that point or has God blown them away? Yeah, God's blown them away. I mean, I, I shared with the church when I came, I shared with the elders when I came, I said uh, to them, I said, uh, God told me that I'll pastor a church of 5,000 people. And they were kind of surprised by that. And they said, well, that's a long way from where we are. And I said, I know it. And I can't tell you how many years that'll take, but God told me. And I really felt like he did. Mm. Now, that went earlier on, but I felt like one time in prayer, God gave me a vision for what I was supposed to do in a church as far as how to lead it. And he told me, you'll pastor a church of 5,000. Well, we've well surpassed that, more than doubled that, and I did not see that. But mm -hmm. I, I saw the 5,000, and um, um, but the thing is, you know, Darren, let me just say, you mentioned the boldness part. I, I would say that if anything, uh, and I say this to pastors at conferences and things, is that the one thing that held me back is not being bold, not trusting God. You know, it's like you can get a dream and you can get a vision, and I really felt had no doubts in my mind God had given me a dream and a vision what I was supposed to do. But you get too worried about uh, people being happy with you or too worried about people being upset with you. And because of it, or too worried about failing, mm. and because of it, uh, I wasn't being bold. And it came, it actually didn't happen in my life until about 2012 or 13. Um, I went through a health scare and... Um, ended up with a pacemaker, and uh, after that, in prayer, I just felt like, man, I was lucky to have survived that, mm. and I just felt like God saying, Steve, you need to trust me. You just need to trust me, and I felt like I was trusting you, God. I don't know what you want, <laughs> and he said, he made it very clear. I've shared this with our people. He made it very clear. He said, you walk in faith, but it's a very calculated faith. You don't take a move until you've dotted every I and crossed every T. I want you to take, I want you to trust me and move out even if you fail. Mm. And uh, at that point, things really changed for me. At that point, I recognized he really wants me to be bold. And so we started taking aggressive steps at church. And uh, we had a few missteps, but a lot of successes uh, just trusting him. Mm. And so my point is, I tell pastors that all the time. Now I look at that and I, th I said, you know, I know where we could have been wow. if I'd have been bold a decade earlier, but it cost the church because of fear. Mm. And, um, and I think there's pastors all over this country that have a vision and a dream, but they're scared to death of their elders and trustees and what people are going to think. And it's keeping them from stepping out on faith. It seems like throughout the entirety of the scripture, that continues to be a, a theme, right? Like yeah. God's pretty passionate about, hey, yes. hey, be strong and courageous. You know what I mean? Do not fear. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be bold. Yeah. I, I love that you brought that perspective of looking back and going, man, I wonder where we could have been. Mm -hmm. And I think some people can look back and maybe, maybe they're, maybe somebody's listening right now, they're watching Steve and, and they're that business leader. And they're looking back in regret of, man, I, I should have responded to calling. Or they're a church leader and they're going, man, he's right. I've been scared. And we can see that and we can we have those moments of regret. But um, we can't go backwards, right? We can't. Life's a one-way street. Mm -hmm. And so um, what's a simple word of encouragement? Maybe there's somebody that they, they, they had a sense of calling. They fought it. Or they're, they're, leading, they're leading in the church right now and, and they know they've They've got to lead strong, especially right now with where our country is, right. where the world is. What's a simple word of encouragement to them? Well, I just think that, you know, trust God. God's never going to ask you to do anything that he won't equip you to do. Hmm. Never. And so if God is asking you to do something, then your part, it's a partnership with God. God's always faithful to do his part. The question is, will we do our part? Yeah. And so if God's asking you to do something and you believe you've heard from him, then your part is to step out and trust him. Yeah. And even if you fail uh, that's all right. Failure is not, you know, it's not the end of the road. It's usually a pretty good instructor. It is. Yeah. We learn so much from it. Yeah. And so, you know, I just wouldn't let, uh, just don't let yourself be controlled by fear. Yeah. I you love know, it. You just got to uh, be bold and trust him. You went after a bold approach, uh, writing a book that's coming out here pretty soon. Uh, tell us about the book. It's called Creatures of Habit. I'm excited about it. It won't be released until May. Um, but I'm finished with it and excited about it. And it's just the idea of, you know, we have so many things. We invite Christ into our life, and then there are so many things that keep change from taking place. God wants to transform our life. 
You know, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things passed away, all things become new. And so people say, well, you know, things haven't changed for me. Well, it could be that you're hanging on to some of those old things, some of those old patterns. It could be pride, it could be lying, cynicism, you know, on and on it goes. And so I cover 12 of those uh, in the book and just say that if we don't break these old habits in our life, they become spiritual strongholds. Mm -hmm. And those spiritual strongholds then are very difficult to break. In fact, sometimes even takes... uh, counselor to help you break them. And so um, I think it's just, I just talk about what those habits are and how some steps to take to break those habits so that you can experience the new life that Christ wants you to experience. We were talking to Mark Moore, uh, one of our guests a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, and he brought my mind back to a quote uh, from Dallas Willard, who he says, you know, in the church, there seems to be quite a bit of magical thinking of this idea that, you know, well, you, you, you pray the right thing, and you may come to church often, and then magically, you know, your life just changes. Or we, we, we mistake that idea. You know, Dallas Willard says, another one of his quotes that I love is that, you know, grace is opposed to earning, not effort. Mm. And so th- there is a step of, you know, if we're going to become the person that God's created us to be, if we're going to be able to live in the fullness of what Christ has called us to and, and, and what he wants for us, it, it is. There's there's disciplines. There's habits. Exactly. There's, there's structures to it. But... Um, I maybe it's more it's what's definitely more lazy. It's easier to just think, well, I'll just you know, there's been a magic bullet somehow it'll just happen for me. But uh, but we have to embrace those habits. We have to embrace those disciplines. What is what are some of the the, the things that you unpack in the book that that just to, to tease folks as far as some of those habits that you that we need to break or need to to actually bring into our life? Well, lust is one of them. Mm. You know, and lust is a difficult habit to break because it's so much a part of our soul and other people can't see it. Mm. And so it's one of those habits that's easy to just accept and not deal with because nobody around us knows we're dealing with it. Mm. So we feel safe. We feel like, okay, I can do this. I'm not hurting anybody. And so we accept it, but it's it's affecting every area of our spiritual journey. Mm. And it's keeping us from being all that God wants us to be. And that's true with actually all of these, whether it's, yeah. you know, pride. We all know that pride goeth before a fall and, mm. and uh, um, prayerlessness. You know, there's just a, a lot of areas that are keeping us from what God intended in our life. And once, you know, he who the sun sets free is free indeed. And so once you break those bad habits and replace them with good habits, then all of a sudden you're experiencing the fullness of joy. You're experiencing all that Christ had for you. But as to your point, um, you know, Peter talks about that comes with training. You know, it, it's not like uh, you're going to get this by osmosis. You put your Bible <laughs> under your pillow at night, and when you wake up, you got it all. It'd be neat if that worked that way, yeah, wouldn't it? <laughs> but it doesn't. It, doesn't. You know, it's, it yeah. takes spiritual disciplines, and it takes work. And uh, so if I want to grow, then I've got to I've got to take the steps necessary to grow in my faith. Mm. Steve, one thing I want to hit uh, is your passion for pastors. Mm. Uh, my dad was a local church pastor for 25 years and lots of joy, lots of good things, but honestly, a lot of bad, a lot of pain. Yeah. And 2020, unprecedented time for the, the world. But I've talked to a handful of my my, my buddies that are still in, in local church work, and, and I kind of part-time am. Sure. And they said that that especially this summer was some of the most heart-wrenching and difficult seasons of of leadership they'd ever been in. And um, you have a heart to work with pastors and get pastors to work together. Um, what do you see right now on the, on, the, on the horizon of where pastors are, especially from your perspective of, of, of being one for as long as you have? Well, really, right now is a tough time, Darren, because of COVID especially. And pastors uh, oftentimes struggle anyway, just like they're human beings, and so they have their insecurities, just like you have your insecurities, everybody does. And, um, and then they oftentimes get boards that are jumping on them or people in the church sending them nasty emails and that type of thing. But during COVID, it's, everybody's anxiety level has risen to a new high. And because of it, oftentimes they're taking it out on the pastor. And because everybody has different expectations about, you know, do you wear face masks? Do you not wear face masks? Do you, re- do you reassemble as a church? Do you not? And everybody's very outspoken. And so the pastor's hearing it from every side. And every time he makes a move, then the other side's angry with him. If he switches, the other side. And so it's just adding to their, uh, to their anguish. I, Ed Stetzer is a, a church growth guy. Yeah. And um, 
Ed said, just did a survey, and uh, it was released about three weeks ago, and it said that 90% of pastors in America right now are considering resigning. And his response to that survey was that he said, you know, we, we quickly say, oh, but they won't do it. And he said, who's to say they won't do it? He said, this is really serious what's going on right now in ministry mm. because we can't afford for all these pastors to say, I'm chucking it. I'm not yeah. doing this anymore. Yeah. And, um, and I would say uh, it's been one of the most difficult seasons of my ministry. And I've been in doing this a long time and I've gone through some rough times, but this bar none, this uh, three to four or five month period has been the most difficult that I have ever experienced. Mm. And um, so I am concerned for pastors out there and um, financially, they're struggling. 25% of churches are uh, on the brink of closing their doors because of finances. Mm. Um, and so if you're, if you're struggling with all of that on top of it, it just makes it hard. And so I guess I, I would say, Darren, to those watching, encourage your pastor. Mm. You know, Take the time to email him and just say, hey, I just want you to know I prayed for you today. I just want you to know I think you're doing a good job. Mm. Any words of encouragement will go a long, long way right now yeah. with pastors. And what, what about pastors reaching out to, to one another? I just had, a, I, I, I was so humbled. I got a guy reach out to me this past week. I got to have a conversation. He's trying to figure out God's next step in his life and if he should stay at a church or go. And, and we just, we talked for 28 minutes on my phone. I got done, looked at oh, 28 minute conversation. And, and it meant the world to me that I could, I could help. Sure. And, but I feel like, I don't know. And, and maybe I think you're right. I mean, everybody has insecurities and maybe business leaders are the same way. And, and, but you maybe you don't want to call another pastor because you feel like you're competing for exactly. him, all these things. Exactly. And so you live, you allow yourself to struggle in this isolated way because I guess you believe you're supposed to be perfect. You're not going to have any. But, but, but man, I, I think there's such a need for pastors to be there for each other as well. Yeah, I mean, several years ago, uh, over a decade ago, I started a ministry in town called Partnership of Churches. We then changed it to City Mosaic. And the whole point of that ministry uh, people thought that the point of it was to help the poor, but that was just the tool. The point of partnership of churches was to get to get pastors to work together, mm-hmm. to get pastors to tear down the barriers. You know, we've got so much, again, going back to insecurities, is that we're so threatened by one another. Mm-hmm. When it comes to the church world, it's not the congregations that are the problem. It's the pastors, mm-hmm. because they're always afraid of losing people to the next guy. Wow. You know, and so... And so because of those fears, uh, they're afraid to, uh, you know, if you start talking about a pastor to me, if I don't know him, I may nod and say, well, yeah, I didn't know that. Wow, that's hard to hear, you know, that type of thing. But if I'm meeting with that guy, if I'm meeting with that pastor and I'm praying with that pastor and you say something to me about him, Mm. I come to his defense. Yeah. I'm going to say, you know, now, wait a minute. I know him. Yeah. He's a great guy. He loves God. Yeah. And so... So my thing is, is that you've got to get pastors to know one another so they can tear the walls down so that we have each other's backs. Yeah. And whenever you do that, I have a strong belief, Darren, that whenever that happens, when pastors start working together and praying together and it builds that each other up, that's when revival is going to break out in a community. Mm-hmm. And that's been my prayer for Indianapolis. So we put partnership of churches on hold for now. Uh, a lot of reasons behind that city mosaic on hold, uh, but I still believe I'll go back, you know, maybe in my retirement years, I'll go back and start that up because I truly believe that um, in the importance of getting pastors to love one another and pray for each other, yeah. to have each other's backs. In a time like like we're in now, we've got to have it because I really, I really strongly believe, Steve, that we there's a future yet to be created. And there are things that look bleak on the horizon for our country, but yeah. I believe that 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 God wants to see that future created by, by his sons and daughters, by his leaders, by his church. And it's not going to happen if we can't come together, you know, and, and you, you look at the, the, the weight of, of issues of, of racial inequality and justice and whatever I would love. And I'm praying that we would see the church, not, not wait for the government or whatever is the church right rises up and begins to show our country and to show the world what, what true, you know, harmony and, and, and justice and yes. righteousness looks like. And it's not yes. going to happen if, if we're isolated in that. So I know we have pastors that, that watch and listen to the podcast. If, if you're isolated, if you're alone, if it, you know, humble yourself at the same time as being courageous yeah. and reach out, yes. make the call, you know, or if, you know, I, I can't believe I'm, you know, as old as I am now, but like I'm realizing now in my, in my age that 
you know, how can I look for that 25 year old, that 35 year old pastor that may feel like he doesn't know what he's doing or he feels alone that, that, you know, for me to start reaching out, you know what I mean? And so if, if you're a, if you're a more mature pastor, find somebody that you can pour yeah. your life into, or if you're a younger one, you know, reach out, reach, you know, across whatever, whatever it's a denominational, racial, whatever for, yes. for one another. You know, I, I oftentimes say that unity is the secret sauce to the success of the church. Mm. And I really believe that unity. So the thing is, if I'm going to teach that, then I've got to live that. Yeah. And if I can't live that with the, with the pastor across town or the pastor a few blocks down from me, then why would my people want to live it out? Mm. If they can't even see the church world live in unity, why would they think they have an expectation for them to live in unity yeah. with one another? Yeah. And so I just think... Uh, pastors have got to do just what you said. They've got to pick up the phone. They've got to call somebody and say, can I take you to lunch? Yeah. You know, just make some acquaintances, make some friendships. You know, during this, during this uh, COVID crisis, I've had pastors from around the country that are friends of mine that have called just because they need a listening ear. Mm. But the fact is because we had a relationship, yeah. they felt like they could do that. Yeah. You know, well, we need that on a local basis as well, mm. where pastors all feel like, you know, let's just get together and we don't even have to pray. Let's just get together and shoot the breeze. Right, let's yeah. just talk. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it can make such a difference. Uh, I love your passion for pastors. It's uh, it's so, so necessary. Such it good is. stuff. Such good stuff. We'll, we'll, we'll land the plane here, Steve. What I want to say is if you um, if you could go back to you jump in the van, you know, 40 years ago, whatever, but to, you know, Steve Poe, the rock and roll drummer, you know what I mean? And <laughs> you ride to the next, you know, gig with him. Uh, and he's trying to figure out everything that you were trying to figure out then. What, uh, what, what do you say? What do you say to that kid uh, riding to that next gig to, to open his mind to, to what God has for his life? Well, you've got to, you, you know, um, I believe that God speaks to us. I believe in the power of prayer. And I believe that God speaks to us. And I think the key is uh, faith. You know, the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so faith and trusting, again, that God's not going to ask you to do anything that he won't give you the ability to do. So trust that. Mm. Uh, be bold with that. And uh, as you go forward and take steps, um, you're going to grow. Uh, people around you are going to be influenced by it as well. But um, you'll start to see God's plan unfolding for your life. I love it. I love it. I'd wish we could all jump in a time machine and go back and talk to our 20 year self, wouldn't it? We, we'd miss a lot of the oh. U-turns, a lot of the dead ends, but we'd also uh, miss the, the, the growth exactly. and the joy of the journey. But Steve, I can't thank you enough for being on the podcast, uh, for the, the, the journey that you're on, the life you've lived, the legacy that you've left here in, in our town and with Northview Church and just uh, is an inspiration. It's a joy to have you on the podcast today. Well, thanks, Darren. Thanks for all you're doing in the community, man. You're making a difference. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And we're back from Steve Poland, huh? Rock and roll drummer. I mean, business owner, then pastor, then mega church pastor. Such a freaking awesome journey. And here's the deal. You downloaded this podcast. Maybe you subscribed to it for a reason. Right? You weren't looking for a cooking show or it wasn't like, oh man, I got a problem with some some moles in my backyard, my lawn. There's a problem with my lawn. Have you ever had that where you get the, the moles? I don't know what they are. I think they're the moles where you, you, you're walking in your backyard and then there's the, you could, like your foot wants to go down. There's tunnels being dug in your backyard. I've had that before. It's terrible. It's not a good thing for your backyard. Now, if that's happening, we got to get rid of that, right? <laughs> no one wants moles in their backyard, but you didn't download this podcast because you have moles digging tunnels in your backyard. You downloaded this podcast because you are somewhere in a process of trying to figure out who God's created you to be. You're trying to walk this journey of calling. And so you're like, you know what? I'm going to start downloading the Darren Wine podcast because I want to discover who I was born to be. I want to, I want to actually take this next step because there, there's probably something eating at you, right? Where there's maybe a sense that, that, that there's a life that you want to live or that you are maybe created to live and you're not there yet. And so something under the surface, maybe deep in your spirit is, is churning and you want to figure out how to step into that. That's a good thing. Welcome to the party, right? That's where we all are walking. 
And in that journey, I think there's a, a, a story arc of, of, of how we step into this. And here's the steps that, that I'm seeing through Steve's story that we just listened to and I've seen in my life and I see in so many people in the Bible. And it's this, is we resist, we negotiate, we wrestle, and then we submit. And when we submit, we're satisfied. If we don't submit, we begin to suffocate. And so as you look at Steve's story, right, he talks about that, that he sensed that God was, you know, calling him, but the immediate thing he began to do was resist it. No, I want to be in business. That's what I'm doing. I've got gifts. I've got abilities. I've got stuff I want to do. And I don't know about what God is doing. I'm, I'm going to resist that from the, from the, from the drop, right? And, and, and I, I felt that in my life. I've told you the story here on the podcast before. Same thing with Steve. I wanted to be a rock and roller. I wanted to be Tommy Lee and Motley Crue, right? And then God comes to me and says, hey, about pastoring, how about ministry? And I'm like, no, right? I resist that. The good news is that almost every story that I can find in the Bible, when God shows up and starts calling someone, they resist the calling. Like you just look across, right? Moses, right? Ah, no, listen, I don't talk well. I can't do this, right? Get somebody else. What about Jonah? Remember Jonah? Talk about resisting, right? I mean, uh, Gideon, how about Gideon? If you don't know the story of Gideon or Jonah, you get in the Old Testament, the stories of that. I'll read you a little bit here in a minute. How about Saul, who became Paul, who started the, the basically all the churches, most all the churches in the New Testament and wrote like a third of the New Testament. What about him? Well, there was quite a resistance to the call in his life. I think it's funny as, as you look at the story of Gideon, right? And, and this angel shows up, things are not going well for the Israelite people. And so God comes to call Gideon to lead his people. And God shows up and says, an angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And, and I love Gideon's response. He says, pardon me? <laughs> like, huh, me, what, pardon me? And then he starts actually arguing with God because things are not going good for the Israelites in, in this situation in the Old Testament. And he says, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, do not did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? I love this interaction with, with Gideon, right? Is that God doesn't explain to him all the things. Like he's like, oh, are you with me, right? He's resistant to this call. God says, hey, here's the deal. Um, I'm with you. You're a mighty warrior. So here's how I see you. Here's the call I have in your life. And, and we're going to go after this. And Gideon resists, and then he begins to, to, he's not even at a place of negotiating yet. He's just mad. And I love the fact that God doesn't go into the whole thing. He says, no, listen, how about this? We're just going to go in the strength that you have. We're going to save Israel out of Midian's hand. And am I not sending you? Like, I'm God. I have a call in your life. This is the deal. But right off the bat, he, he resists. And then in his story, he, he does begin to negotiate. Right, then he realizes, oh, wait a second, this is actually God actually sending me to do this. And so he's like, well, hey, what about, what if we do like some stuff here? And then there's a sacrifice situation that happens. And then you may know Gideon's thing where he sets out the fleece multiple times. And he's like, well, I'll do it. Like if the, if the fleece is wet, like I'll go. And then the next time it's like, well, if the ground is wet, but the fleece is dry, like he, he begins to negotiate. And then you got Jonah. Remember Jonah's story, Jonah in the well? Maybe remember that from, if you ever went to Sunday school. It's funny because, and Jonah's story is, is God comes and says, hey, Jonah, uh, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come before me. So Jonah kind of knew what God was doing. They were in a connection somehow. There was a relationship, and he gives him a specific calling. I need you to go and preach against the Ninevites. And he immediately resists. It says, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. <laughs> He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed from Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Some of you listening right now, you this is you, right? You look back and it, maybe it was when you were 20, 25. Maybe it's when you were 15. Maybe it was when you were 35. Maybe it was last week. Is you were, you were in a relationship with God. I mean, God began to call you into something and you were like, no. And not only did you say no, like Jonah didn't just resist. He ran. He ran from it. Now, if you, know, uh, if you know Jonah's story, it's kind of funny because he gets on this ship and then all of a sudden this huge storm breaks out, right? And the sailors are freaking out, right? They're trying to figure out what's wrong and uh, they don't know who's responsible for making the trouble, right? On the boat, they're all gonna die. And I think it's hilarious that it says that, uh, that Jonah answers the people and he says, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And they were terrified and this terrified them, and they ask, what have you done? 
And then it says here in parentheses, it says, they knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. <laughs> Which I think it's funny. It's like Jonah got on the boat. Hey, guys, could I get on the boat? Listen, God's got a call in my life. I'm totally running from it. Uh, just trying to get the heck out of Dodge, right? Or for him out of Nineveh. Um, and so it's an interesting place to be in that oftentimes I have talked to people that they are running from God and they know it. Like it's not even a mystery. They're resisting what God is calling them to do. And in Steve's story for him, it was to go into ministry for you. Maybe it's, maybe it's ministry. Maybe for you, it's a, it's a, it's a change of, of, uh, of boyfriend or girlfriend. Maybe for you, it's a change of career. Maybe for you, it's actually just entering a relationship with God, but you begin to resist. Then you negotiate. Then you negotiate. I think you you see that in, 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 uh, in Gideon's story. Um, I guess you kind of get it in Jonah's, right? He's like, hey, you know what, guys? Just throw me off the ship. It's just better if I die so you guys don't. Uh, so he negotiates. And uh, the good part about Jonah, he gets uh, swallowed by a, a fish for three days and three nights, and that throws him up on the beach. It's quite quite a great story. But you resist, you negotiate, and then you wrestle. In that story, you could think about, um, I guess you think about the story of, of Jacob, right? God's calling him to, to come and reconcile with his family and, and he has this moment where he resists, he begins to negotiate, and then he actually finds himself wrestling with God, wrestling with an angel. And um, and what's really intriguing about that story about Jacob is that in the moment is that as Jacob is, is wrestling with the angel, the angel actually changes his name. He says, you have been known as Jacob, and Jacob means he deceives so he says, hey, here's who you were. Now I'm calling you into something else. Your name will now be Israel, which means wrestles with God. And so I want to encourage you because here's the deal. Whether you're at the point, maybe you're resisting, maybe you're negotiating with God for your call or you're wrestling with God. All of these point to a lack of trust in who God is and a lack of knowledge of who you are. So plot yourself on, on, on the map, right? Remember you go to the mall and you get the red dot. You know, remember when you went to the mall and there was a directory there? Maybe when you could go to malls, that was neat. Um, and you would find out, oh, I am here. I'm right here by J.C. Penney, okay? So in this calling story arc, where are you? Are you resisting? Are you negotiating with God? Well, God, I would, I would go to college. Maybe I would go to the, I would go get a degree in ministry, God. But if, but here's the deal. If, if I go, like you promised me that I'll find a wife, or if I go and do this with, for you, God, like we promised me I'll make this much money. Or maybe you're negotiating. Maybe you're wrestling. If you're in any of those three places, I want you to know that, that, that what, it's, what it's showing you is that you've yet to form um, a deep trust in who God is. And you may be struggling for knowledge of who he's created you to be, of who you are. And um, the good news about being in one of those places is that Jesus says there's a really simple uh, solution to that, which is this, you ask, you seek, and you knock. Jesus says, listen, ask it, it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock on the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receive. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. And so if you're at a place of resisting, negotiating, or wrestling, the next step is that you need to grow your trust in God. And here's how you do that. You begin to ask God to reveal his heart to you, and you ask him to give you an undivided heart for him. It's a great prayer. I remember talking to a college professor uh, when I was in college and trying to take these next steps and, and, and becoming the kind of person that God would have me to be that I could step into to his plan for my life. And I remember a professor saying, here's a great prayer for you to, to pray. Wake up every day and ask God to give you an undivided heart. You want a prayer that God pro promises you he'll answer 100% of the time? Wake up every day and say, God would give me an uh, undivided heart for you. And begin to seek and ask and knock and say, God, listen, I need to know your heart. And you say, how do I know God's heart? If I'm out of place and I know it, I know I'm resisting, I know I'm negotiating, I know that I'm wrestling with God. Here's the good news is you look at all these stories, you look at Steve's story, you look at my story, you look at your own story. Let me tell you what's going to happen in the future. Let me prophesy into your life here. I'm not even a prophet, but here's the deal. Is once you come to know God's heart, you will trust his way because you'll know that God has your best interest at heart. You'll know that he is always for you, not against you. You know that he, you'll learn that he has actually created you on purpose and for a purpose, and he's, he's, he's put gifts and abilities and talents. We talk about it every single week here on the podcast. You'll begin to realize that there's no better place in life than to actually trust where God's leading you, and you will step into that once 
you trust his heart. Well, how do you know and trust God's heart? Here's what you do. You come to know him through his word. He said, give me a practical step here. I know that I'm resisting. I know that I'm negotiating. I know that I'm wrestling. How do I actually move through this to a point of submitting and to a point of being satisfied with, 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 with what God has, has put in my life to do? It starts by getting into the word of God. I talk to people all the time and I say, tell me, what does it look like your, your time in God's word? I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't like to read. Hmm. Okay. Um, the cool part now is there's actually ways that you can get in God's word now without even reading it. You can listen to it. You download the Bible app and there's tons of, of, of versions of the Bible that you can listen to. Uh, and, and maybe that's where you need to be, but you're going to struggle to trust God's heart if you don't know God's word. And the beautiful thing is he's given us the Bible for the opportunity for us to get to know him and the way he has interacted and guided and directed and persevered and blessed people for thousands of years. These stories in the Bible help us know his heart so we can trust his way. So ask for an undivided heart, get in the word of God. And then here's the deal. This is the tough one, right? You ask, you seek, you knock. And I think in this situation, right, I think that that that, that the ask and seeking knock, there's, there's a faith piece there. But as you begin to submit, there's a lot of risk in that. That you actually say, you know what, I'm going to submit. I'm going to trust you with my life and my plan. And what you'll find is as you, as you actually submit your plans and you submit your life to God, you will be satisfied. Steve talked about that in the interview, right? Is he had chased it. He had been successful. He'd been successful in business. The problem was he wasn't satisfied. And I think in our life is when we don't step into the call that God has on our life is we, we're not going to find the peace and the satisfaction that we're actually seeking. And what will begin to happen is we'll begin to suffocate in the life that we've, that we've created for ourselves because it's not what we were created for. Here's the cool thing. I, I guess it's cool, but it's, it's dangerous, is that God will allow you to choose whatever life you want. Jesus says, I came to give you life and give it to the full, but it's an option. If you want to stay in a place of resisting and negotiating and wrestling with God, he'll give you that life if you want it. But what I have found time and time and time again is that it's a life that suffocates. It's a life that's less than. It's a life that is not full of peace. It's a life that is not full of purpose and passion. I was just talking to my best friend, Brent Moore. We went out and did a little mentoring conversation with my oldest son. And, uh, and Brent was talking about what it felt like to step into God's call in his life. He thought he was going to do the military. Then he thought he was going to be an oral surgeon. Then he stepped into being a dentist. And he was walking through this process with my son. And he said, talked about just submitting his life to the Lord and trusting the Lord's path in his life. And he said, you know what? I would never trade the peace of God for any level of success. That you wake up in the morning, you go to bed at night in a rest and a peace because you've submitted your life to God You've trusted his heart and his ways, and you're satisfied with life. This, uh, this made me think about um, just um, this scripture from Jesus, right? Where he says, hey, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the, to the one who knocks, his, the door will be opened. And um, I found a note in one of the Bibles as I was searching through this. And this idea of being satisfied is it brought my, 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 my mind to being at peace, right, and at rest. And Clement of Alexandria, one of the early church fathers, uh, he, ad he attributes an additional saying to Jesus uh, about, from this passage. It's, it's not in the canon. It's not in the Bible. But uh, Clement from Alexandria, he, he says that, that Jesus uh, also said this, the one who seeks should not cease until he finds, and in finding he shall marvel, and having marveled he shall reign, and having reigned he shall rest. And I feel like I'm living that out, hearing Steve's story, I feel like he's living it out, and as you see the, the, the biblical stories that we've already shared here, is that I wanna get you to the place where you're marveling at your life where you wake up satisfied and at peace with where God's taken. Does it mean it's perfect? No. Does it mean your marriage is really simple? No. Like parenting, is it just, that's no problem because I know my calling in life. No, life is still life. There's still struggles in it, but you're at a place where, where the, the, at the core essence of your soul, you're at peace, you're satisfied, and you, there's a, you're marveling about the life that God has invited you into, that you know him, that you trust him, that you have his peace, and that you've actually been equipped and empowered for the, the mission that he's given you. And when you marvel, you can reign, you can lead with God, and then you can experience his rest. Oh, what a journey. 
what a journey. And that's, um, that's what I want you to step into. That's why we do this podcast, because I do believe from the bottom of my heart, what we're sharing here today and every single week, it's not, it's not a story for special people. It's not a journey where there's some people that are called and you're just here to waste time on earth until you die. That's just not the case, friend. You were created on purpose and for a purpose, just like Steve Poe, just like me, just like Gideon, just like Jonah, just like Paul, just like Jesus. And you're going to find yourself in that story arc. You're going to resist. You're going to negotiate. You're going to wrestle. But I want to encourage you to ask God to teach you to trust his heart, to, to seek his ways to seek who he's created you to be and then to trust, to knock as that door's open and then submit, run through that open door and become who you were born to be. It's a phenomenal journey. And I'm stoked that we get to take it together. Be bold in it and step into it. I love the conversations that we get to have. And I would love to hear from you. If you got questions or you, you, you want to, Maybe dig into this a little further and you got a personal situation that uh, you'd like me to speak to or help out with. Just send me an email, darren at blackbirdmission.com. Would love to dialogue with you. Or you can always text me, 317-550-5070. Would love to hear from you. Ask, seek, knock. Step into this journey. God bless you. I love you. Thanks for hanging out. Never forget, God's for you, not against you. He's near you, not far from you. And he has created you on purpose and for a purpose. I'll talk to you again next time on the Darren Rewind Podcast. Thank you.